Good afternoon. On behalf of the American Legion, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, and all veterans, welcome. Thank you for taking time to be here today for this Veterans Day ceremony. We know that 11 a.m. on November 11, 1918, the armistice ending World War I, was the beginning of the current Veterans Day. It became an official holiday in 1926 and a day to honor all veterans in 1954. The words of former General and then President Dwight Eisenhower still apply today. Let us solemnly remember the sacrifices of all those who fought so valiantly on the seas, in the air, and on foreign shores to preserve our heritage of freedom and let us reconsecrate ourselves to the task of promoting an enduring peace so that their efforts shall not have been in vain. Several years later, in the words of John F. Kennedy, as we express our gratitude, we must never forget that the highest appreciation is not to utter words, but to live by them. Today we honor all veterans, and we highlight especially the achievements of those from World War I. I want to thank several groups for being here as part of today's program, including members of the Mansfield Ministerium here to my left, the Tioga County Honor Guard, the Brass Ensemble from Mansfield High School, Mansfield Boy Scout Troop 106, who's in the back here, and of course all veterans. In a moment when our brass quintet plays the national anthem, please feel free to sing along. Color Guard, post colors. Our invocation this afternoon will be provided by Reverend John West, pastor of United Methodist Church in Mansfield. Let us pray. O oh God, we are so blessed that you have given courage to those called upon to defend the principles we hold dear. 
we stand in awe of those who gave of their time and valiant energy, taking upon themselves the burden of war and the responsibility of building peace. We come together today in humble respect of those who secured our land from the enemy, who guarded the sacred blessing of freedom, who worked together, learned together, fought together, who served our country in times of conflict and in times of peace. We give you thanks for those who stood in harm's way so that we might enjoy the freedom to assemble here today. Send your blessing of peace to our land and to every land. Send your spirit of reconciliation to enemies far and wide. Invite us once again to beat our swords into plowshares. Teach us again that one day we will learn war no more. But until that day, send us brave men and women who are willing to serve our country. Increase our admiration and respect for them across the ages. And in all things, bless this country. Amen. Let me begin this afternoon by saying a few words about our hometown heroes' banners around town. When the program started, there were high hopes that we might get 50 banners or so to make it look like they were well represented with veterans and they weren't lost by having only a few. Currently, there are 162 banners hanging, 20 more in the process of being going up and nearly a dozen more in the works. We're closing in on 200 banners and a few more coming in every week. I think this is a wonderful tribute to veterans. I've said before that previous memorials, as great as they are, only list names. The banners around town have the names, the branch of service, who sponsored the banner, and most importantly, a face to go with the information. I can't think of a better tribute. Two persons in particular have done a lot of work to make this happen. Valerie Lecter and Jane Wilson. I know Valerie's out here. Uh, also Blue Ridge Communications has volunteered to hang all the, the brackets and banners and have instructions from their boss, Tom Freeman, if they see a problem with a banner as they drive around town in the course of their work, not to wait for someone to ask, but stop and fix it. We need to thank these people. In 2008, on the 90th anniversary of the armistice of World War I, we had refurbished and rededicated the memorial in the center of town. For Veterans Day in 2009, we told several stories of a few heroes who were from Mansfield and whose names were listed on the memorial. By 2010, we decided to make it a tradition to pick several and tell a little bit about the people who served in that war and whose names are on our wall of honor. We don't always have access to information about their military exploits, but we often know the impact they had on our community after their service. The first one, Myron E. Webster, PhD, served in the U.S. Army. He was active in the First United Methodist Church in Mansfield, Friendship Lodge. He was a political science professor at Mansfield State College where he taught for 23 years. He was also known as a junior high school principal. He was well known for his musical abilities, particularly playing the violin, and for his illustrated lectures with original wildlife photography. He also graduated from Cornell University Law School in 1925 and 1923. Private Ross Bailey served in the Marine Corps in France and Germany during World War I, was also a member of the Methodist Church in Friendship Lodge. He served with the Army of Occupation in Koblenz, Germany in 1919. An article in the Mansfield Advertiser says he went through the big fight without a scratch. After reading the paper, well, he was surprised to learn so many boys from over home were over here. After he read about the units to which they were attached, 
Ross said he might have found them had he known earlier as he was close to those units. Private Ross B. Bailey, 96th Company, 6th Marines. Wayne R. Cleveland, after the war, was located at Camp John Wise, Texas in the recruiting section. His designation for U.S. Army was referred to as Uncle Sam's Army. He was an engineer by profession. We talk about our servicemen and women being friends and neighbors. And in this case, for me, it's literally true for all three of these men. Myron Webster lived across the street from me as I was growing up. Ross Bailey bought the house next door to me where his daughter-in-law still lives. Wayne Cleveland lived across the street. Donald V. Horde saw service from the Argonne Front to Flanders Field and came out without injury. Donald fought all along the line and helped hasten the signing of the armistice. He had many close calls, once having been completely buried when a high explosive shell exploded near him, covering himself in a corporal completely over with earth, the earth it threw, flew up. In the Flanders offensive, he saw much of the hardest fighting of the war. His father, Joseph S. Horde, was instrumental in the founding of Mansfield University then Mansfield Classical Seminary. Horde Street in Mansfield, behind First Citizens, is named for him. Many of the stories of military action occurred during the heavy fighting just before the armistice, and some days just days before. Such is the case of Walter Leach, where he, in a letter home, described the action in which he was wounded. The unit was west of Verdun and the Meuse River, where he said, my regiment was in the lead, and all we had to face was machine gun fire, and now and then a one-pounder. But most of the time, it rained those like hail. The third day, we caught a great deal of shrapnel. I saw one lad about 30 feet from me disappear almost entirely. Others went up in a confused mass of arms, legs, and fragments. He was lying on his stomach when he was hit. The piece of shell passed over my head, he said, ripped my pack and gas mask to threads, also a large map in my hip pocket. Another piece caught the muzzle of my rifle, splintering it in all sorts of shapes and causing the stock to give me a crack over the ribs that laid me out. I was lying on the gun for some time. Still another chunk of steel was kept from getting me in the right shoulder by two bandoliers of shells I had slung over it. Leach did get a flesh wound running down the back of his leg from his hip to his knee. He said, oh yes, there was a hole dug in the ground about eight or ten feet in front of me that would hold a team of horses in a wagon. He finished the letter home saying, I'm sorry to miss that hunting trip this year, but we'll be in shape to hustle you next fall. Our soldiers go on with life as usual afterwards. Sergeant Howard E. Dorsett taught school for many years in Troy, was a member of Austin Cox Post American Legion, Mansfield United Methodist Church. He was born in 1891 in Lambs Creek and died in 1969. Ernest McConnell, better known as Shorty McConnell, had a unique Army career. Shorty was sent to training camp, won a sharpshooter's medal, and was shipped to France. He served as a motorcycle orderly during the last battles of the war and was under fire several times. He ran head-on into a hole left by a large shell and was laid up with a broken ankle. In the hospital he met Howard Dorsett. He was back at his old job and this description is apropos for a lot of our service people after having had a whole life's experience crowded into three months. He is perhaps best known locally for his barber shop on Wellsboro Street. These are just a few of the stories. Next year we'll have more. Thanks for listening. We have two pastors that are going to do some prayers of remembrance, Reverend Rowena Gibbons and Reverend Janice Giscant. <laughs> 